am so glad you are here today, and I am glad that I get to be with you at this campus. If maybe you're new to Freedom House, uh, what we do here is we have a teaching team because we like live speakers at all of our campuses. We don't have a video venue where we just beam somebody in, but... We do, this is our broadcast campus, so everything uh, that happens in this room goes all out all over the world right now. So we have Wisconsin, uh, North Carolina, California, Alabama, Idaho, Texas, Maine, Illinois, Colorado, Hawaii, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey joining in. We are so glad that you are tuning in today for our Solid Ground series wrap up today. So this series has been all about how to check your foundation because storms of life are going to come to our house and we need to know how to stand the test of time in our families, stand the test of time in our marriages and in our ministry. But here's the thing. Many of us may wonder that, God, how do I stand the test of time? How do I last? But we probably aren't going to like the answer. Do you want to know the answer? Does anybody online, maybe somebody online, do you want to know the answer online? The answer is the only way to know how your foundation is, whether it's good or not, is to have it tested. And it's a great concept, but it doesn't feel so great when it happens, right? getting tested. You see, what happens is we go through storms and storms are very revealing. Think about it like this. Think about an orange. If you are holding an orange in your hand and you squeeze that orange, whatever is on the inside is coming out. You can't wish it were something different. You can't say it was something else. Oh, that was, it was an orange juice. No, no, no. Whatever is on the inside, when you get squeezed, comes out. And so that's why it's so important to understand, and it's so important when we're walking through things, is sometimes when I'm going through a storm, I kind of like, like here, here's me wrestling with the storm. I kind of step back a little bit, and I watch myself. And I say, what's coming out of me right now when I'm going through this storm? Do I feel insecure, like maybe God doesn't really have my back? Am I lacking trust? Do I believe he's good for his word? Do I get angry? What is anger? Anger is unresolved hurt. Is there some hurt in me that I haven't resolved so when I go through this storm, that's on display? What happens when you go through a storm What happens when the squeeze comes on your life? Watch and see what comes out. Is it a lack of faith? Is it mistrust? Whatever it is, that is what is a crack in your foundation that you need to shore up. Because when the storms come, you don't want to get toppled over because your foundation wasn't solid. So don't get mad because the storms came. Because if your foundation is right, a storm doesn't bother you. So if you're wrestling with the storm and you're mad, ask yourself why. Maybe it's because there's something about your foundation that needs a little looking after. Know what I'm saying? Okay. All right, in Matthew chapter 7, this is where Jesus is talking about the parable of the two houses. Now, Jesus had just finished teaching on the Beatitudes. He'd just done the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus begins to give us this parable, and he contrasts these two houses together. Now, what I want you to understand before we dig into this chapter is when Jesus is talking about the houses and having your house built on a solid foundation, I I want you to understand he's not just talking about building materials. He's not just talking about bricks and mortar. What Jesus is talking about is your house symbolizes your entire life, your entire life's work, everything about who you are, what you have, what you own, all of your identity. Your house is everything. 
So as we begin to dive into this, I want us to understand that's what Jesus is talking about, not, not bricks and mortar. Matthew 7, we're going to start in verse 24. Jesus says, therefore, in other words, in summation of all that I have just been teaching you, whoever, say I'm a whoever, hears these sayings of mine and does them. That is such a novel idea right there. And who does them? Because so many times I see Christians who walk on up into church and they're dealing with the same things that they've been dealing with, the same sin problem, the same issue that they've been dealing with for a really long time. And at some point, we as the church should not be taking the bottle and having to part the whiskers and insert it. At some point, we should be mature enough to not be living our lives plagued with sin. Now, what does that look like? It can look like a lot of different things. If you're a single person in here and you're dating somebody and you're having sex with them and you're not married to them, you're not doing what the Word of God says. If you're in here and you're a Christian and you haven't been tithing, that is such Christianity 101. We're, we're, we're not even talking about uh, liberty offering. We're just talking about the basics of Christianity is being a giver. One of the foundational blocks of being a Christian. Or maybe we got a problem with the mouth and we can't seem to control our tongue. And we, we just want to come in here every Sunday. We want this prophetic word from God. And he's like, if you could just keep your mouth shut and stop gossiping, that would be a good place to start. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we're like leaping over one thing to try to get to something else. And God is like, why would you do that? When you just, just do some of the basic things that we know to do as Christians. And so he's saying, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. That's the part we tend to miss. It's like a man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do them, so when we hear what God has to say and we choose not to do it, he says, you know what? You'll be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. I love what James says. James is the New Testament book of wisdom and Proverbs is the Old Testament book of wisdom. James kind of reiterates this and he says, be Doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You know, why is it that so many of us don't do what the word of God says to do? We struggle. Well, maybe it's because it invokes a conviction which runs far too deep for our personal comfort. So we hear, but we don't do. Correction, when we, are, when we are corrected and we receive it, then it turns into conviction. Conviction brings about movement, which brings about change. So if something truly convicts us, then we are going to line our lives up with what the Word of God has to say. James 1.25 says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. A wise man does not simply understand truth. A wise man acts and does according to that understanding. Now, let me just tell you what that passage that Jesus said, what it doesn't say. It doesn't say 
that the house that was built on the rock never faced any storms, that the only house that ever faced storms was the one that was built on the sand. It doesn't say that. What it says is that the storms came to both houses. It's not that you and I as Christians don't face storms, we do. It's that when we do face storms, we don't have to fall apart. And when we fall apart in the midst of a storm, there's a foundation problem. And we gotta make sure that our foundation is solid or the next storm that'll comes along, it might not just rattle us, it might take us out. Remove us from our purpose because we didn't know how to handle the storm. I wanna show you a building and I want you to tell me what building this is. Can anybody tell me what building that is? Anybody? It's the Empire State Building. Now here's something that I thought was very interesting. The Empire State Building initially was the tallest building in the United States. It was built in the 30s. And of course, you know, man's gotta outdo himself. So we had to compete and then they erected other buildings that were taller. But for a period of time, it was the tallest building in the United States. Now, it's still among the tallest, but it's not the tallest. Well, the Empire State Building has been through a lot of storms. It has gone through a lot of storms, but it continues to stand even as tall and as big and, and as high up into the atmosphere as it goes, it's still there despite the rains, the winds, and the water, it's on an island, it's on Manhattan. So you, you have the water that'll come in from storm surges or different things that could try to hit this building, but this building stands. Let me give you some interesting facts about the Empire State Building. It weighs 365,000 tons, which equates to 730 million pounds. It's a massive structure. Its volume is 37 million cubic feet. Its exterior has got 200,000 cubic feet of Indiana limestone and granite. 10 million bricks were used in the construction. 730 tons of aluminum and stainless steel. Seven million man hours were logged in the construction of this building. One of the tallest buildings in the world, but yet it continues to survive storms. Not only does this building survive storms, but on any given year, the Empire State Building is struck approximately 25 times with a direct hit of lightning. Direct hits, I mean, you can go online and you can see picture after picture after picture where this building was struck repeatedly over and over and over again. How in the world does this building take those kind of hits and continue to stand? Maybe we could learn a thing or two about the construction of the Empire State Building. Why does it stand? First, it was built with the storms in mind. In other words, before it was constructed, there was consideration given as to its purpose. So when they built that building, they knew it would have to withstand the storms and it was built with the storms in mind. The second thing is it is subjected to regular maintenance. They just spent $550 million doing maintenance to the building. Why? Because it's not good enough just to construct a building and have it good, but it needs to be able to have continuous maintenance so it can continue to stand through the course of time. It's incredibly important 
that if things go wrong or the storms cause it to get weak in any way, that regular maintenance is done to make sure that it continues to keep its strength. The last thing is it has depth and not just height. In other words, the foundation is strong. Why? Well, it's got 55 feet and eight inches of concrete that is the foundation that holds this structure up along with 210 pillars underneath of it that keep it lasting, that keep it strong because if the foundation wasn't strong, nothing else could be built on top of it. So how does that apply to you and to me? Well, let's just go back to the parable of the two houses and let's think about what we don't hear. We never hear Jesus say that, you know, one of the construction guys wasn't a good worker. We never hear him say, well, they used cheap materials. The the materials were bad. Or we never hear him say that it was never finished, that he, he left it unfinished. He didn't complete the task, therefore it toppled. No, no, no. We never hear him say he was a bad attitude guy and he he just, just had a lousy work ethic. We don't hear any of that. Not one of it. Do you know what we do here? It says that he didn't plan with the storms in mind. What does this look like for you and I and our houses Is your house built with the storm in mind? Do you know what's coming and have you prepared your house accordingly? There were a whole lot of people these last few years that didn't anticipate the storms coming and their houses weren't ready. There were breaches in the foundation and it cost people dearly. Do you know what storms are coming? Are you listening to the prophetic voice of the Holy Spirit for your house? Second thing, is your house subjected to regular maintenance? Who's inspecting your home? Who can tell you no or call you out and you listen without getting mad? Who can point out when they see a breach and you thank them instead of being insulted? Because if we understand how true community works, we're not gonna sit by and let somebody have a crack in their foundation and we don't wanna say anything. We don't wanna hurt their feelings. I tell you what, it's gonna hurt a whole heck of a lot more when the whole house tumbles on them. We are to be our brother's keeper, to care about each other's houses and our foundations, which is why the third thing, does your house have depth. What does your foundation look like? You'll know when you walk through a storm. If you've gone through a storm and you didn't handle yourself so great, check the foundation. Go back and check the foundation because a house that underestimates storms is going to collapse no matter how good that paint color on the walls looks. No matter those new draperies that you just hung or that new sofa, the cloud sofa from Restoration Hardware, no matter how amazing that sofa is, if your foundation is not solid, it will all come down. Our foundation matters. Sometimes we just focus on the pretty stuff and we don't realize there's cracks underneath. So how do you survive a storm? The simple answer is, is you expect one and you prepare for it by making sure your foundation is solid. Now, when I say things like that, Pastor Penny just said to prepare for a storm, expect a storm. Yes. What I'm not suggesting is that you get into fear. That is not what God is asking of us. God is not asking us to get into fear, but he is asking us as Christians to live a prepared life. What does that look like? Well, think about the parable of the 10 virgins that Jesus talks about. 
He talks about these 10 virgins and five of them ran out of oil in their lamps. And here he comes back and five of them are unprepared. Now, those 10 virgins represent Christians. And so what Jesus isn't saying is that there's five virgins and five non-virgins. There's five Christians and five who aren't. He's saying there are 10 Christians that let the oil go out of their lamp and I'm coming back and they're not prepared. If we just took that statistic and we looked at it and we brought it modern day, what Jesus is saying is 50% of the church is not ready, is not prepared. And you know what? I would like to not have to worry about things that were going on in our world and be on the front lines doing battle and fighting and, and pushing back the dark forces. But you know what? When we have the power of God on the inside of us, we don't get to sit back and pretend like things aren't happening or things aren't going on. We need to know, you know what? My oil's getting low. Oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And when we do not have the oil, we can't hear what God is saying. And when the storms come, we're gonna try and fight the wrong battle or we're not gonna gird ourselves up and prepare. Now, a few weeks ago, I had a dream that the Lord had me to write down and I shared a little bit with our staff, but I went into a lot more detail in our executive team with our, our uh, leaders. And the dream was very specific and it looked like this. God, Jesus, actually took me and we went around the church. We went around the exterior of the church and he was saying, there's a crack here. There's a crack here. There's a crack here. And we walked around the whole exterior and he was pointing things out left and right. Then he took me to our executive team and he said, there's cracks here and I'm gonna show you what they are. And he pointed them out here and here and here and here. Then he went down through all of the different teams and there's probably 40 different teams in this church. And he began to point things out. Then, then he comes over to my house and he starts walking around my foundation with me and he's pointing out there's a crack right there. You've left this open right here. You need to take care of this right here. You got to deal with this right here. Let me just tell you, I am appreciative for that. There is not one part of me that was like, Jesus, why are you picking on me? Uh, can I just tell you in the last 30 years of pastoring, when we point somebody's crack out, that sounded funny. Y'all know what I'm saying. Get your mind out of the gutter. Y'all come back. When we point at somebody's crack, they get mad. Or, or they withdraw. I feel exposed, therefore I'm gonna leave and go to a church where they're not gonna point my crack out. And you know what? They're all over Charlotte. You can pick one. But guess what? Here at Freedom House, we actually believe the word of God is true and it's sharper than a two-edged sword and we stand on the word of God and we invite others to do the same. So if something is pointed out to you, it is not to belittle you. It isn't to make you feel bad. It is not to say that we're picking on you or we're poking at you or we're just trying to annoy you. We are saying there is a better life, a better way to live, and we want to call you higher. Don't get insecure when God starts picking and poking. 
You know why? Because what we're saying when we do is, God, leave me average. Leave me average so I can just feel comfortable being average. You won't find that word in God's vocabulary. God doesn't want us being average. He wants us to be prepared. And he's gonna show us areas where we're not prepared, like in our marriage. Storms are gonna come to your marriage. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. No, no, no. I'm not saying that disaster is coming to your marriage. I'm saying storms of circumstances, storms of change, storms of uncertainty. Storms come and you need to expect them. Raising kids, expect a storm and prepare. Somebody could have said amen right there. My, uh, my youngest one decided to tell me this week, y'all, for those of you who don't know, all of our kids are grown and out of the house, hallelujah, we're empty nesters. We got to talking about something. My youngest one decided she was gonna have a confessional that I just wasn't ready for. She said, we were talking about something to do with the house, and she's like, yeah, y'all probably need to update your security systems and add some more cameras, because there's one room of the house that's not covered by a security camera, and it's right under the window where the air conditioning unit is, so it's real easy to step up inside the window. I was like, stop. I don't want to know anymore. Stop. She thought it was kind of funny. I was like, yeah, you're telling me now when you're in a safe zone, but you knew you would have gotten in trouble. The storms are coming for your children. It is estimated that within 10 more years, 40 to 50% of our young people will identify with the LGBTQ, Elemento P, alphabet soup. (laughs) Do you know why? Because we're not preparing for the storms. Take away Disney. Get them out of the public school. Do whatever it is you need to do to prepare for the storms that are coming in relationships. Do you expect a storm and be prepared? How do you handle disagreements? Have you healed from your own trauma? Because if you haven't, when you get in relationship with other people, it's going to pop up in culture. Expect a storm and be prepared. So when your boss comes to you and says, I'm gonna need you to put your pronouns in your bio and I'm gonna need you to to put the gay pride flag up on your page, you're gonna say, no, you won't even have to think about it because, well, am I gonna lose my job? You've already thought about it. You've prepared. The answer is no. Understand that now before the storms come, That way we can be proactive instead of reactive. Now, this was years ago, but my husband, uh, my husband, we were in our house in Richmond, and he thought it would be a really cool idea during the middle of a thunder and lightning storm to stand out on the side porch and watch it with our dog, I might add. Poor Georgie. He's out on the front porch, and all of a sudden, lightning strikes the tree that's right beside our house, goes all the way down the tree, and literally the bark peels off, and it like daggers, shoots right across his head, right across his face, all around his body. It was like a matrix scene. It was crazy, and it shoots, and it lands right in the siding of our home. It was like daggers sticking out of it, bark, flying that fast that it literally is like all up and down our siding, flies right by his head. It was so strong, it knocked out all of our front porch lights, blew the bulbs out. Now, I'm about to make myself look really old, but it blew out our answering machine. It blew out our two VHSs, you know, camcorder stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of you, where are my old people? They're my old people, okay. Blew all that stuff out, blew out our appliances, blew out my washer and dryer, darn. Wasn't sad about that one. Blew all of it out. Then 
Not just there, we realized that it had come up through the tires of my husband's new car. Because see, we had just gotten these computer chip things that went into cars. And all of your car was electrical now. And it ran off this one little chip, blew it out. Couldn't do anything. Car completely destroyed. Blew it all out. Do you know what? My husband learned a thing or two in that storm. He learned to get under covering. And here's the thing. Once you've been through a storm, you're a little smarter for the next one. You don't hang out on the front porch when the lightning is cracking and popping, right? So let's go back for a minute. I want to go back and I want to have a conversation about the Empire State Building again. And the reason I do is because I want you to know how this building can take direct hit after direct hit after direct hit after direct hit by lightning and not fall. When I looked this up, lightning is actually five times hotter than the sun. So how does a building that's way up there in the atmosphere, see, that's what we tend to do. We tend to look at those that kind of like have this big presence or big whatever, and we don't realize you can be just for show and not be willing to stand the test of time. Shooting stars is what I call them in ministry. We've seen them for years. People that just come on real big, they're on the scene, and everybody wants to flock, and oh, they got a word, I got a word from God, I got to let's run to this, run to this, and they're They're like a shooting star. We chase that. We chase that stuff. Instead of looking for the North Star who has consistently been there and you may have overlooked it until you need it on a cloudy night in the middle of a storm. The Empire State Building has a lightning rod on the top of it. And I want to show you what it looks like. You see, when, when the building gets hit, lightning always goes for the highest point. That's why you're a business owner and you can't understand the attacks. The higher the skyscraper, the more attacks, the more storms it's going to face. But if God built you to do what you're doing, he built you with the storms in mind. Do you understand? So it hits that lightning rod because it always goes for the highest point. Towers, trees, buildings. It hits the lightning rod and it takes that energy, that five times hotter than the sun energy, and it sends it down through the foundation and it disperses it through the ground. That is how that building is able to stand hit after hit after hit, after hit. But here's what I want to say to some of you that are in the room right now. You see, some of you are playing it small just so you won't get hit. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Let me just tell you, you don't get to make yourself small just to avoid attacks. You don't get to. If you want to be used by God to do significant things, standing through storms needs to be common practice. If you can't handle the five mile per hour winds and you're saying, God, grow my business. God, grow my family. You add a few more kids on there. Let me just tell you, you're going to feel it. Don't ask for five if you can't handle one. That's why we stopped at three. I'd have had 20 if I didn't have to birth them all. That's why I got a staff now. That's what they're for. Cook for them, bring food into them, correct them when they need it, get all my little mothering skills out, but I didn't have to birth them. If you can't handle five mile an hour winds, don't ask for more. You want the promotion at work, but you're already frazzled where you are? No. 
But what God will do is he'll show you where you're deficient and he'll show you where your cracks are and your foundation so you can grow. And so he can give you more later, if not now. If you hide because you don't wanna be a target, you're saying what God did for you wasn't enough. It's called living in fear. Living in fear. So we talked about the rain and the storms. What happens when the floods grow? Well, let's go back to the Empire State Building. And it goes back to preparation because Manhattan is surrounded by storm surge barriers. Because see, sometimes when, when we anticipate the storm and a few days have passed, it's kind of like the aftershock. We don't anticipate that because of all the raining that the floodwaters rose. And so the storm might not have knocked us out, but then, then we're, we're not on our game because we just went through the storm and we're a mess. And so when the floodwaters rise, we don't know what to do. But what they do in Manhattan is they put storm surge barriers in place. And what does that look like? It looks like you as a person having boundaries in your life. Let's just talk about that quickly. What does that look like? Say in your family, your marriage. In my marriage, my husband and I have boundaries that we set at the very beginning and we don't break those boundaries for anybody. One of them is unless I am married to you or I birthed you and you are of the opposite sex, you will not be riding in my car with me by myself. So one day when one of our young, wet behind the ears, creative team members who was over, we were meeting over there in the, the building you saw, the, the brick house. We had our meetings over there. Um, this was several years ago. He said, hey, Pastor P, I know you're headed back over to uh, the, the building. Can, can I jump in the car with you and ride over? And I said, no. And he said, are you joking right now? I said, no. I said, men don't ride in my car with me by myself. He's like, Pastor P, it's like, 15 seconds, and I looked at him, and I said, you're single, and you're not married, so let me give you a piece of advice. Listen to somebody. I think at the time, I'd been married for like 25 years. I said, I've been married for 25 years. That's older than you are. I said, I have boundaries in my life, and one of them is if you are a man, you ain't getting in my car. I said, I don't care if it's two seconds. You ain't getting in my car with me. Because my husband and I have those boundaries in place and he knows if there's a man in my car, there's a problem. And he's gonna ask me what the problem is. I said, so you know what you can do? You can sit on the hood of my car and I'll drive you over, but you can't get in my car. <laughs> it's funny because right, right after the service today, a man comes up to me and he's like, Pastor Pete, matter of fact, you know what? I'm just gonna tell on him. It was Thurman Wells. It was Thurman Wells. I'm going to tell on you, Thurman. He comes up to me and he goes, Pastor P, I wholeheartedly agree. One time I was outside and I was, I was by myself and I'm highly allergic to bees and I can go into like, you know, anaphylactic shock and my throat can close and all that. And I got stung by a bee. And I, I went over to the neighbor who was in her car and her truck getting ready to leave. And it was just her and me. And I knew my throat was gonna close. So I got in the, the back of the pickup truck. I said, Thurman, if you're about to die, get in the freaking car, okay? It's not what I was talking about. His wife's just laughing. I said, Thurman, that's so you. Like, can't breathe laying in the back of the pickup truck so he's not in the car with the, I said, dude, it, like, if, if I happened to me, I just want you to get me to the hospital. But that, again, that would signal to my husband something's wrong. Do you understand? So please, if you get stung by a bee, get in the car. If you're not stung by a bee, get out. Get out of the car. That goes for lunch meetings. I don't care what your boss said. You should not be having lunch meetings with the opposite sex by yourself. <laughs> Boundaries. You want to know how to not have an affair? Never, ever be alone with the opposite sex. I guarantee you, you won't be having sex with them. You see how simple that is? 
It's just a simple boundary. Same thing for my single people. You wanna know how to not slip up and, and lose your purity? Don't be at the apartment late at night with the candles going and Barry White in the background. It's real simple. It's real simple. This isn't hard stuff, y'all, but it's lack of boundaries will cause the storm waters to surge. Just go through your whole house and put boundaries up. With our children, our children weren't allowed to have the internet in their rooms. No computer and your phone can't come in your room. It has to stay outside. Stay at the door. You can plug it in at the door and we reserve the right to go through that phone whenever we want to. Boundaries. And the parents said, amen. Amen. The last thing, we talked about the storms. We talked about the, the rains, the floods. Let's talk about the wind. I wrote this down because this is what happens in a storm. It's called wind loading. And I want to read uh, from an architect's point of view what happens when wind comes against a home in a storm. As the wind blows against a building, the resulting force acting on the elevations is called wind load. The building structural, the building's structural design must absorb wind forces safely. How does this go to build with the storm in mind? The structural design must absorb wind forces safely and efficiently and transfer them to the foundation in order to avoid structural collapse. Wow. Wind on the roof surfaces can cause negative pressures. It's called wind uplift, and it creates a lifting force sufficient to lift the roof off the building like it's peeling back a sticker. Y'all ever seen that? Literally, you've watched tornadoes or hurricanes, and it looks like somebody just peeled the roof back. That's called wind lift. Here's what I want you to understand from that. Once the covering, hear me, once the covering is removed from the building, the building is weakened considerably, and the rest will likely fall as well. Men, can you stand on your feet? All my men. Men, I'm talking to you right now. When the covering is not on the home like it should be, then things are allowed to creep in that should not be in. When I was reading this architectural digest, it said that the majority of the time that wind will sneak in through cracks. It could be cracks in the foundation, cracks around windows or doors, and especially garage doors. What does this say to me? What this says to me is that men... We need our covering over our heads. And when the covering isn't in place, the whole rest of the house is susceptible. And you know, I think in society, the reason why you guys are picked on so much is is because the devil's trying to loosen you and weaken you until you just say, forget it. But I want you to know here at Freedom House Church, we love you, we thank God for you, We need you. We want you in position so we can come and be the support that you need and stand alongside of you holding back the winds and the rains and the floods. Ladies, can you stand alongside the men? The thing that was so important that in this architectural article, it said, is that the covering must be anchored to the foundation in order for it to stay on. Men, I want to encourage you to do a home inspection. Look for cracks in the foundation. Now, just like the Lord took me through, it is not to point out every area where you failed. And I know that as men, I've been married to Troy Maxwell for 31 years, been on his arm for 33. 
the failure, the failure vein for men runs strong. And so when things are pointed out, it's not to say you're a failure. It's to allow you an opportunity to shore things up so you don't fail, so your house doesn't fall. So it stands strong when the winds and waves come. At some point, your house is gonna be shaken. But how a house responds during the storm reveals the integrity of the foundation. Proverbs 10, 25 says, when the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. I wanna go back to the picture I showed you before of the lightning rod. And I want you to see something that maybe you didn't see before in this picture. When I look at this picture, I see a picture of Jesus who instead of allowing us to take the direct hits, he was lifted up high and repeatedly struck to protect us and keep us covered even though the strike was meant for us. He took it in our place. And not only did he take it, but he, he took death, hell, and the grave, which was meant for us, and he went down to the foundation of the earth, went down into the pit of hell, and he grabbed the keys of death and hell, and he took them back. So you and I could have the opportunity to stand strong and stand covered. Would you close your eyes and bow your head? I wanna ask you this question today. I don't care if you're a man, woman. I don't care how old you are. If you know your foundation has some cracks in it and you just wanna acknowledge that and say, Lord, please show them to me. God, show me the areas where the enemy may have breached, where our house ha has been shaken. If you know that, that you want that revealed to you, I want you just to lift your hand up. Say, God, that's me. That's me today. I know you're gonna show me things, not to beat me up, not to pick me apart, but out of love. Here's the second part of this. Today, maybe you would say, I'm not even sure my house is built on the right foundation. I want to introduce you today to Jesus. If you would say, that is me today, I want to know Jesus. I I'm kind of new at this. I don't really know a whole lot, but I want to grow. I want to learn. I need a fresh start. If that is you today, whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room and you say, I need a fresh start, would you just lift your hand up? Just lift it up today. Thank you. Thank you. Who else am I praying for? I just wanna know who I'm praying for. Thank you. Thank you in the back. Anybody else before I pray, just say, man, I wanna get in on that. I wanna get on that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all say this together. Say, Heavenly Father, we thank you that when the storms rage and the waters rise, we are built on a solid foundation because you're our Lord, you're our Master, you're our Savior, and we invite you in. Lord, do a home inspection. Breach the cracks. And may we be humble and teachable. In Jesus' name, give it up for him today. Give it up.